faces a thankless job. It has 32,000 employees overseeing more than 300 ports of entry, patrolling 6,000 miles of border between Canada, including Canada and Mexico. In a single year, the agency will field about 5 million applications for immigration benefits such as citizenship and work permits and green cards. It will also, the agency will also catch about 1.6 million people trying to enter illegally along the southwest border each year. And many of these people are, are desperate and willing to do, to, whatever, to do whatever it takes to get into the United States. As one top INS official told us during our reporting, just being in the United States has got to be like gold around the world. We recognize what a precious commodity it is, and we try to make sure to the best of our ability that those who lawfully can be here are allowed to be here. Now, I also want to be clear that many people in the INS do the very best job they can and are very dedicated. <clears throat> but the fact is, is that the way the agency as a whole has carried out its duties and its mission has often been outrageous. The agency's heavy hand falls on people most Americans will never see. They are children as young as eight years old who are held in a secretive network of prisons and county jails. They are parents and spouses of U.S. citizens who are deported or imprisoned without due process of law. They are asylum seekers who are greeted not with the promise of haven, but with jail. And they are people for whom the Statue of Liberty stands not as a beacon of hope and welcome, but as a symbol of iron-fisted rejection. As one member of Congress told us during our reporting, the Immigration and Naturalization Service is like an onion. The more you peel it away, the more you cry. I'll tell you a little bit about how the story got started. One of my colleagues at the Oregonian, Julie Sullivan, began writing about some of the asylum seekers who were remaining in the Portland jail, including the girl who cries, the one I mentioned earlier, and others who had won their asylum cases but remained locked up by the INS. While she was doing those stories, a few months later, another reporter at the Oregonian named Rich Reed began writing about the high rate of rejection of business travelers at the Portland International Airport. They would come in with papers allowing them to come in to do business, but the Immigration and Naturalization Service agents there were rejecting them at a very high rate. So much so that Portland was beginning to get a reputation as a place for international business people to avoid. In one case, a businesswoman from China was strip searched and jailed, even though she had, as it turns out, legal papers. Rich also wrote out the story of Claudia Young, a German citizen who was married to an American. Claudia said she made a mistake on her visa application and thought she was going up to the INS office in Portland to straighten things out. In fact, she felt she'd been invited up there, so she went up to Portland with her husband and her 18-month-old baby. And instead of receiving help, she was handcuffed. Her child was taken away from her. By the way, she was still nursing this child and immediately deported to Germany. And only through the power of Rich's reporting were her mother and child reunited. Now, this coverage reached a worldwide audience. And an Asian news service went so far as to call Portland De Portland because of the growing reputation that it had because of the INS office there. Rich and Julie began talking among the two of them, and they, they began to realize that every time they did a story, they would hear more and more problems from all around the country, not just in our, our town. They thought, well, you know, Oregon doesn't have a reputation as a place with huge immigration problems, and yet we have this, these problems here. How about other parts of the country? So they came to me. And they came to another reporter at the paper, Kim Christensen, and they asked us if we could help see how big the story would get. And we said we would help. So that was Labor Day weekend of 2000. And about three and a half months later, and about 25,000 words later, we published a series we called Liberty's Heavy Hand. It ran for six days, and this is some of what we found. We started first by looking at what the law says what the law is supposed to do, and how the law really works. In 1996, Congress passed and President Clinton signed two immigration, quote unquote, reform bills. Among the measures of those bills, the, ch the changes, that is to say, they included a mandatory imprisonment for thousands of immigrants who previously could have just simply posted bond while waiting while their deportation cases worked their way through the courts. Instead of being able to post bond and be released, now they're held indefinitely, sometimes for months and even years. The law took away the power of federal judges 
to review these jailings or even to order the INS to release people who were improperly jailed. We also found the law breaks of families. The law eliminated due process rights and barred many immigrants from the United States for as many as 10 years just because of problems that they previously could have fixed simply by paying a penalty or a fee. Among the harshest provisions of the 1996 law is one that allows the government to reach back in time to use crimes that can be decades old or of a minor nature as grounds for deportation. Let me give you an example of this. When our stories ran, a man named William Finn was bracing for his third straight Christmas behind bars and facing deportation while sitting in a jail near Seattle. He was facing deportation to the Dominican Republic, a country he had left at age one. Now, he admits that he broke the law. He stole a VCR, and he stole about $98 worth of tools. And in Alaska, where he lived, these are misdemeanors. He was convicted. He did his time, 53 days in a halfway house. The INS targeted him for deportation for these small crimes. Now, under the old law, William Fenn could have been released while fighting deportation, and he could have been making a case on the merits that he should stay in the United States. Instead, his jail was mandatory. His, his jail time, rather, was mandatory at a cost of $20,000 a year to the U.S. taxpayers. Now, this is all over a VCR and a handful of tools. Meanwhile, his two daughters, aged 10 and 12, and their mother were living 1,500 miles away in Anchorage, Alaska, surviving on welfare benefits because she's disabled and she was relying on his auto mechanic's salary for support. She told us, you know, my kids are heartbroken, especially the little one. She's constantly asking her about her dad. She's literally built a shrine for him with pictures and whatnot. We found also that the way the INS carries out this law can be troublesome. The agency on any given day keeps about 20,000 people in jail all over the country. Well, where are these 20,000 people? We first asked the INS this question. The agency really couldn't say. So we filed more than 100 Freedom of Information Act requests, many of which were aimed at trying to find out more about this secretive jail system. And what we found was this, that the system which holds 20,000 people is secretive. It's poorly monitored and many people who are detained are kept in places where they're subject to abuse. The INS often loses track, literally forgets where they are, forgets that they're there, and can move them capriciously from one jail to another, far from their families and the lawyers who are trying to help them. We also found a lot of bungling by the agency. The INS allows its district directors to run the show locally as they see fit. Now, many district directors are very good, they're very compassionate, and they try to do the best they can with a very harsh law. Others, however, have created fiefdoms where the law is applied unevenly and the quality of service is very erratic. For example, the INS loses files, tens of thousands of files each year. And if your file is the one that's lost, you must refile applications and refile fees and start all over again. The wait for benefits can be months and even years, and if the agency loses your file, you have to go back to the end of the line. We also found a lot of cases of corruption. In the Portland office, for example, one agent stole fees uh, that she used to pay for her gambling habit. And then this crime caused long delays for the immigrants who had paid those, who had paid those fees and were expecting services in return. It turns out that, we learned, that stealing money by uh, INS fees by local INS officials is a common problem. It's one that's been identified over and over again by audits and investigations, but it's not one that's been fixed. We also found out that the Portland office for years has tolerated racism and sexism, and there was a long-held practice there of INS officers hiring prostitutes when they went out of town on business. Meanwhile, the INS overall has had ranks that have included smugglers, drug dealers, rapists, murderers, as well as agents who extort payments from immigrants in lieu of passage to the United States. As one Justice Department official told us, the INS is notorious for having the most serious and pervasive management and misconduct problems of any part of the Justice Department. Now, the stories went on and on, and many of them were backed by congressional investigations, Inspector General reports, 
and audits by the General Accounting Office of Congress. And when I say backed, I mean this was some of the many resources we relied on for our story. For every account of every anecdote we published about somebody's case, we had many more standing behind that. People who were willing to talk to us but were fearful about being quoted, didn't want to go on the record. They were still too fearful of the INS, even though their cases might have been settled long ago. The only series in the reporting, particularly of Rich and Julie early on, had impact. The local INS director was, well, let's just say he retired early. And it shed a lot of a light on some of the problems, particularly at the airport, and with the way the local office was being run. We've now seen, in the last couple of days, as, in fact, just as of Wednesday, something that we haven't seen in a long time. The Immigration and Naturalization Service has stepped forward with some very serious ideas for reform. In many ways, the reform plan put forward by the current commissioner is a good one. See, today you have an agency that's trying to do two things at once. It's trying to serve immigrants by giving them services, and at the same time, it's trying to enforce the law against these very people it's supposed to help. The plan that's been put forward proposes to split the enforcement and services side, perhaps reducing a little bit of the tension that now exists within, this, within the agency. The plan would do away with these district directors I talked about. It would also help the INS better share information with other agencies, which is very important. One of the agencies the INS is supposed to be sharing information with is the State Department, which actually issues visas. And in today's world, when we're trying to protect our borders for security reasons, that kind of information sharing is critical. It doesn't happen as much as it should now, and this should help speed it up. The proposal would create an ombudsman to give people an outlet for complaints and concerns. And it would also create an office just to deal with issues of juveniles to help deal with the kids who get caught in the INS net. Now this is just a start, and it's just a proposal. And I want to be very clear about something. Our stories were not alone in helping bring out this change, or this proposal for change. Many dedicated journalists for years have pursued this story, and our voices were just joining the chorus. The sound got a little bit louder, though, I gotta tell you, when the stories won the Pulitzer uh, in April. Now, I, let me talk a little bit about this experience for just a second. Everybody who's in journalism, I think at one time or another, thinks about what it must be like to win the Pulitzer Prize, and, and it's, it's really a special moment. This is particularly special because the Public Service Gold Medal is the top category, and that's what we got. It's sort of like winning the Oscar for Best Picture. And I, I confess, I had always wondered what this was like. Well, I'll tell you what it's like. It's like being hit by lightning. The odds are great against it ever happening to you. And then when it does, it hits with this big blinding flash, it's gone just that fast, but you have this sort of tingling feeling that hangs on for a long time. The people you work with look at you and wonder how, how the heck it happened to you. <laughs> and you wonder that yourself. And i got to confess, there's a lot of luck involved in this. But what I've learned in our experience and through the experiences of some friends of mine who have also been lucky enough to win a Pulitzer is that you make a lot of your own luck. The four of us who worked on this story have worked very hard in our careers trying to be the best possible journalist we can be. And when you get a rare moment, a rare opportunity like this to pour all of your efforts into a story that can make a difference, well, you do that, and that's all you can ask. We also know that winning a Pulitzer Prize doesn't change our lives, and nor should it. You know, within a day of the announcement, we were right back at work on new stories, moving ahead with whatever else we were working on. I'll tell you how wild I got when I found out we'd won. I went out to celebrate by buying a new lawnmower, actually. It hasn't changed the four of us because we know that it's not really about us. It's about the stories we write, and most importantly, it's about the people we write about. They're the ones who faced hardship, and they're the ones who faced pain and fear, not us. We just wrote their stories. But it has prompted me to think more about what it is we do. And coming here today has prompted me to think about when I was in college and what I wish I knew then that I knew now, having had all of these experiences. So 
I could talk for a long time, for hours, about journalism, but I'm going to do what newspapers do best, and that's boil things down. I have four handy tips I want to pass along to anybody out there who is aspiring to do this for a living, or has ever thought about me, perhaps trying to make a difference. The first tip is this. You have to really love what you do. Now this applies to life in general and most jobs in general, but with journalism it's particularly important. Journalism is too competitive and too demanding, too exacting and too absorbing not to get into it without really loving the work. We're now, after September 11th, I think we're entering an era, I hope we're entering an era, where news is really going to matter, where there's going to be a new seriousness, where the years of Monica and OJ and the other social flotsam that's filled media will hopefully go away for a long, long time, where we can really continue to provide a service. But at the same time, we're entering a very dangerous era, I think, as well, when we're civil liberties and the First Amendment is sometimes at risk. Right after the September 11th attacks, a columnist in Oregon was fired from his job because he dared to criticize President Bush for not returning to Washington right away after the attacks. Now you might not agree with his opinion, but he has every right to say it, but he lost his job over it. We have national TV networks agreeing to censor uh, tapes from Osama bin Laden and his followers. Uh, for no real good reason, I have to confess, that I can see. Where, where I guess my question is, what are we afraid of hearing? But yet, we have voluntary censorship going on. Bush administration has also moved to limit access to, what, to documents that should otherwise be public, again, out of concerns of security. But again, First Amendment questions get raised. A free and active media can fight the loss of liberty, and you really got to truly love the business and love the craft in order to want to wage that fight. That's tip number one. Tip number two, if you want to be a writer, you should write every day. I was talking to some students earlier and it, it dawned on me that having a skill of writing can help you in almost any profession you choose. But if you want to write, be a writer, it, the solution is simple. You must write. Many people dream about being a writer. They think about it, they read about it, they talk about it. But a writer is someone who sits down each day and writes something, anything. A story, a poem, a letter, a journal entry, anything in order to sharpen the skills. Because writing, like any craft, requires a lot of practice. At the same time, becoming a writer means being a very good reader. By good reader, I mean reading all the time. Read everything you can, newspapers, magazines. I suggest reading great books and studying them to, make, to find out what it is that makes them great. I suggest reading really bad books to find out why they stink so you can avoid those mistakes. I'd read the great journalists of our time, people like uh, David McCulloch, and the historians of our time too, David McCulloch, Seymour Hirsch, and Robert Caro. Read poetry so you can uh, see what it takes to make the written words sing. In other words, you have to work at it, and you have to really want it. Tip number three for journalists is dare to be different. The great reporters of our time, the ones that have really made a difference, have known the same thing as the great artists and composers of our time, and that is this, that if you're doing the same thing that everyone else is doing, it's, it's no way to have an impact. Now, we've all heard the phrase pack journalism. That's when all the media chase the same story at the same time. The best reporters look very carefully at what the pack is covering and then go the other way. The best reporters go where no reporter has gone. They tell stories that no one else has told. And they listen to people who have not been heard. And that leads me to my last point probably the biggest lesson we learned in the immigration series we did. H.L. Mencken, the col a columnist, is credited with one of my favorite lines about journalism. He said, reporters' task in the world is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. I have a friend when working in a newspaper one day, we were sitting next to each other and he turned to me and he said, you know, we have the greatest job in the world. We're paid each day to go out and pursue the truth. And I love both those 
comets, one by a close friend and one by someone who's quite famous. And when you put them together, it's sort of been what I try to accomplish each day as a reporter. Our, constitu our constituency should not be powerful corporations or politicians or government agencies or conventional wisdom in any of its forms. We serve our readers and we do it by showing them the people in their community whom they seldom see. This is the impoverished and the hungry and the whistleblower and the people on the raw side of justice. Our jobs are to seek out the people who cry out and then only to find out they have no voice and that they are greeted only by a stark silence. So what's our calling? Our calling is to always to seek justice and always to seek the truth and to always to fill that silence with their voices. Thank you. Thanks. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. What happened to Jang, the girl who cried? She was um, eventually released to uh, someone who, who was identified as a family member in New York. She spent about six to eight weeks. I think I'm, I want to be very careful because I'm not exactly sure of the time. She spent about six to eight weeks in jail after she was granted asylum um, before she was released to someone who was identified as a family member or a relative uh, in New York. So she was eventually let out. And um, I don't know. Julie has kept track of her, but we know generally where she was when she was released. Oh, by the way, one other story we just found out. William Fenn, the gentleman I mentioned before, uh, who had been jailed for stealing the VCR and tools, I, I wanted to know what had happened to him. It turns out he was finally just released a couple of months ago. So I'm don't, not sure, but it was at least it was more than three years in jail for after having already served time for his misdemeanor. May I ask a question from here? Sure. Uh, you've said that the one responsibility of a journalist is to report the truth. What are some of the challenges that you as a journalist face in getting to getting the truth and arriving at the truth and getting to the truth? This is a really good question. The question is, if we're supposed to pursue the truth, what are the challenges we face in pursuing it and looking for it? The truth is elusive because everyone holds their own truth. Everyone has their own perspective on what it might be. It is a goal. It's not often attained. But our challenge is this, is oftentimes to sort out what can be not just both sides of the story, but all sides of the story, multiple sides of the story, in order to put together a composite of what we can at least agree to be true. In the case of our coverage of the Immigration Naturalization Service, it is not easy to accuse a large government agency of malfeasance and mistakes and all the other things that we were able to establish in our story. But the fact is, sadly, and, um, and, uh, and again, I want to point out, this is it, notwithstanding the great efforts of a lot of people who work at that agency, that it is a very troubled agency. And there wasn't much debate over the things we were finding. Um, we felt we could establish a lot of the information in our stories as quote-unquote truths because people from all sides of the political spectrum, even people within the agency, were able to agree on a lot of what we were saying. And so we, we felt like we had a baseline that we could work off of, of being able to say, well, we know at least this much is established or, tr if you will, true. It's very elusive. Um, you know, one of the great exercises that sometimes happens in journalism classes is as, as a teacher or professor will be talking and they'll have someone interrupt the class and then run right back out of the room. And the professor will ask everyone in the class to describe in detail what just happened. And there will be a version for every single person in that class. Everyone else has saw their own truth of what occurred in that moment. And that makes it very, very difficult when you're trying to establish a 
a single story that reaches the truth. It's a goal. It's a, it's an ideal. And <coughs> understanding that that's your, that's your pursuit is, at least takes you in the right direction. Hi. Um, I had a question about ever since the September 11th attack, um, the mood of the country has changed quite a bit, and with the uh, INS, they've got new questions for INS officials with visas, especially student visas, I know have been kind of questioned. How do you think that would have changed your series or would have uh, raised new questions for the series? You know, that's a really good question. We've been asked that a lot. In fact, some critics of the series in Portland have said we, we owe the INS a big apology because they should have been tough in the first place. And my response to that is you don't fight terrorists by strip searching business women and putting kids in jail and putting up with the hiring of hookers. Um, our series was, was really about something other than security at the borders. Nonetheless, the INS has a key role in this. And, what, and to the agency's credit, the INS is not the only player here. You have the State Department, you have the FBI, uh, the tracking of visas is something we, uh, our, our paper has written about since September 11th, using some of the expertise we have about immigration. And what we found is this, is that the State Department plays a key role in a lot of this. The failure of the State Department and the INS to share information has hampered the INS in its effort to try to make sure that people are, are uh, here legally, and if they're on a student visa, they stay just as long as they're supposed to. Uh, a few years ago, there was an effort to set up a tracking system for visas for business visas and for student visas. And there was such opposition from lobbying groups, universities, businesses, and so on, against the tracking system that it was never put into place. Um, it's amazing to think that uh, there are visas, people with visas are not tracked. And yet, uh, as we know now, some of the terrorists were, were I, I don't know the exact number, I want to hazard a guess. That about a dozen of the ones that we think were, that the government thinks were on the planes on September 11th, we're here on visas and we're here legally. And so this is getting a lot of scrutiny. Um, I think that in the case of security, the INS is just one of many players. And they have done a very good job in some cases. Um, but they're also working with um, uh, a number of other agencies as well. So the idea that the Bush administration is trying to do is to put all this under one, answering to one person the Homeland Security Chief, Tom Ridge, because I think is an effort to try to pull it all together. How it would have changed our story? It clearly would have put it all in a different context. Um, it would not have changed the basic facts. It would not have changed the basic facts that the 96 law, one of the, there were two laws, by the way, that changed immigration uh, rules in the country. One of them purported to be an anti-terrorism law. And the fact is, is that so much of the pro so many of the problems we found were not really aimed at uh, terrorists per se. A lot of it was aimed at the southwest border. A lot of it was aimed at um, uh, at concerns about from concerns raised by members of Congress from Texas and California, and it was, didn't really relate to the issues we face today. Can't say for sure how it would have been different. We, our conclusions would have been the same. We probably would have had it in a different context and perhaps framed differently. But we, we feel that everything we we found still stands today. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, a couple of questions. Um, how long were you covering the story, and um, were there any repercussions about what you wrote? How long were we writing the story? Um, let's see, the story really started about a year before we published our series. And Julie Sullivan, who I mentioned, started, had started about a year earlier. Rich Reed and other reporters started about nine months earlier. We, we started in earnest working on a series of stories to pull everything together about three and a half months before we published. So, and the repercussions were that the, um, uh, the local director uh, retired. Uh, there were a lot of efforts to reform the local office. Uh, district director was brought up from San Francisco who did, a, I think, a very good job 
as an interim director trying to straighten things out. Um, and it sort of, as I said before, contributed to the overall sense that this agency really needed to be looked at and, and to whatever degree help spur along some ideas for reform nationally. Uh, it, it is a very, very difficult issue and I don't expect changes to be, no one expects changes to come overnight. But I think those are some of the repercussions of the story. Um, what about you personally? Um, anybody told you anything? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that last part. Anybody told you anything personally? Um, did you get in trouble because of what you were owed or anything like that? I, I'm sorry, I have trouble, trouble hearing. What about you personally? Yeah. Um, anything told you? In, anybody told you anything like you shouldn't be doing that? Or oh, I see. Like well. Um, <laughs> No, you know, in terms of being warned off the story or threatened, no, that didn't happen. Um, many, many people I dealt with at the INS were very helpful. Many others were not. And in fact, there were a couple of cases where I was told out and out lies by people at the agency. So the problem really wasn't being warned off the story or being told not to write something. Um, our editors uh, were very much in support of what we were doing. Um, it was controversial locally. Um, some readers, I don't want to say most, but a few, thought it was perfectly fine that foreigners who are coming in get all the scrutiny that the local office was giving them. Uh, we got a lot of calls that had, not a lot, I don't want to characterize it that way, we got a few calls that had racial overtones that people thought it was perfectly fine to be treating people this way. But for the most part, um, we didn't feel any pressure not to do the story. The biggest challenge was getting the agency to be forthcoming and to be precise when we asked questions about how it operated. And that was our biggest challenge. And um, knowing that we didn't want to spend months and months and months on the story, that we felt we wanted to put something together as quickly as we could, but as carefully as we could, we knew that the, our big challenge was getting the agency to respond to us in a timely manner. And I mentioned before about the Freedom of Information Act requests we filed, for example. Some of those were still coming back months after the story ran. And so uh, we weren't completely successful in that sense, but we did our best. So that was our biggest challenge. Thanks. Yeah. It's a good question. Hi. You said that now um, the media, with the current events, the media is censoring voluntarily. I just want to know what do you think is the appropriate balance that the media can find between protection and information concerning Afghanistan and the war on terrorism? I think it's a really good question. What's the appropriate balance? And I was specifically referring to the agreement of some of the networks to limit the broadcast of uh, videotapes from bin Laden or his associates. I think we all remember the first videotape that came out after the September 11th attacks a lot of the networks just ran it continuously, the video of it at least. And that raised a lot of concerns. Um, you know, I, I think that good news judgment made on a daily basis is probably the best answer. Will news agencies always make the right choice? No. Sometimes they will go overboard. I think the problem comes when they agree ahead of time that they're going to do something, that they're going to hold back before they even know what they might get in the future. Um, that's not balance. Um, if a new news agency goes over the line, the public reacts, and people who run these agencies make adjustments in the future. And I think the appropriate balance in this case is often, uh, it's hard for me because I'm not the one making these decisions. It's hard for me to say, but I would have to argue that on the side of open information, if you give, in this particular example, let's say we get more tapes from bin Laden. Do we need to run them endlessly over and over again? No. But should we air out what he tells us? I kind of think so because I think it's important that the public see what we're up against. And one of the ways we learn is by hearing firsthand. And so there is a balancing act that's involved there. But uh, agreeing to withhold ahead of time is, I think, not part of the balancing act. Um, who does make those choices? 
Um, in the cases of the networks, I think there are managing editors and news directors at all the networks who make those decisions. In this case, I don't know where it started, but in this case, the White House was involved in encouraging the networks ahead of time to, to restrain the broadcast of future tapes. And this is, these are big decisions that are played out way above, way out above my head. I, I'm not sure who the exact that these people are, but they're going to be executives at the various networks. That's a really good question. As, as we can become more concerned with security and more and more government information becomes off limits to disclosure, how do we combat that? Well, the first way we combat it is to write about the fact it's happening. Uh, in today's atmosphere, it may be hard to get the general public up in arms about the fact that materials in the National Archive or other kinds of records that would normally be public but one of the ways we can do it is we can show, continue to show people how we have benefited, how our knowledge has benefited in the past from having access to these kinds of records. Uh, I think we can do a better job of explaining that when we get access to things, we don't do it just because we think it's fun, but because it serves a purpose. It provides insight into decision making and policy choices. And uh, one of the ways uh, I've tried to do it in the past, when I, when, for example, when I use the local state records law in Oregon, this always make a point in my stories of saying, we got these records by using this law, the Oregon Public Records Law. Or if I write about material that I've gotten through the Freedom of Information Act request, I always try to put that in my stories so that the reader knows that this isn't just on some shelf someplace, but we had to go fight for it, and we had to go ask for it. And I think that's, a, that's one way to communicate to people that there, there is a need for open access. Now, in a broader sense, Media organizations are in court all the time fighting legal battles to keep this information public. And it's sort of a many, there are many fronts to this legal fight. And, I, and that's, those are the two ways that I know that, that it's, it's being fought. Um, um, you mentioned earlier there was a lot of corruption in the I, INS. Um, has c c the Congress or anyone taken like, any type of legislation to stop it or appointed any officials like to oversee it? That's a really good question. Is there been any efforts to try to stem the corruption? Well, I can tell you that people in the INS are really concerned about it, and there have been a lot of efforts. I mean, all of the things that have gone, been all the wrongdoing that we identified has been we know about because the Department of Justice caught people and convicted them. Um, beyond that, I, I think there has been a lot of discussion in Congress about what to do about the the people they hire and how to make sure rules are being followed. And I can't put my finger on any particular piece of legislation or proposal that's been out there, except to say that I know the people that run the INS don't like it either. And they've tried very, very hard to make changes. And uh, I think that some of the reforms that have been proposed last week will take some of the pressures off the areas within the agency where that have seen lots of these problems. Um, you know, the INS, in all fairness, would say every agency of its size will have people that break the law. I think the thing that we found that set it apart was that people in the Justice Department told us that it had more problems than it should. And it's an ongoing battle every day to try to make sure that uh, the laws get followed. Thank you. Yeah.